Hey, welcome everyone to Active Prospect, The Last of Us, TCPA Survival Guide for the Entire Ecosystem. And before we begin, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Earl McCarthy. I'm a sales director here at Active Prospect, and I'll pass it on to my other fellow colleagues that are here on this panel. I'll kick it off with Justin. Hey everybody, um, I'm also on Earl's team, been with Active Prospect almost four years. Uh, we're excited about uh, the conversations that are gonna happen today. Manny? Yes, I am a founder and CEO at Quote Velocity. Uh, we are an insurance focused lead generation team, um, operate a call center with a few hundred agents, most of whom are here in the US. And um, our focus is on inbound and outbound consumer acquisition on first party uh, vertical specific paths. Chris? Chris? Yeah, my name is Chris Lyle. I'm also uh, a founder of the Lead Hustle, and we specifically uh, help out attorneys in the legal space with uh, their uh, lead generation, but also I'm also a practicing attorney as well. I do intellectual property and patent prosecution, uh, and that's kind of my bread and butter, but we also uh, work in the lead space quite heavily with other attorneys. I'm Eric Troutman, czar of the TCPA. I run TCPAworld.com, partner at Troutman Amin LLP. Uh, and uh, I think you guys all know who I am, so go ahead. Perfect. Thank you for the introductions, guys. We really appreciate having you on the panel. So the first topic, we're going to talk about the risk of lead buyers and sellers and lead generators. So I'm going to start with Manny. I'm going to kick this off uh, to you, how long have you been in the lead gen space and what is your some of your experience that you have had um, with uh, TCPA um, risk? Yeah, so uh, started in mortgage lead gen back in 04 and kind of the uh, AOL mortgage days. Um, after a lead gen hiatus, after the crash of, of 08, um, I operated an affiliate network and came back to lead gen in, uh, in 2018. And we built our remote call center uh, around, I believe it was July of 2019. Obviously the biggest change in between those years was the focus on calls versus um, lead distribution, as well as compliance, both uh, in the vertical we operate in, as well as just the broader call center space. Um, in an effort to sort of make sense of this and um, add whatever value I can on this short call, um, I'd like to look at obviously outbound and inbound separately um, and indicate and just list a few obvious practices that could help you with each. Um, for outbound dialing, if you're using Vici or a custom dialer, you'll want to be passing the data through something like uh, DNC.com's litigator database prior to outbound dialing. Um, some companies like TrackDrive and others have native integrations for TCPA scrubbing as well as automatically enforcing uh, TCPA daily limits like we have in Florida. Um, I'd be aware of what I refer to here sort of as like sleeper issues. So for example, when you're asking your agents to assign callbacks into the future, um, if agents run with that idea, they may end up scheduling consumers to be called back in AEP, which could be six plus, in our case, um, which could be six plus months from uh, when the conversation with the consumer took place. In that given time frame, the number may have expired or sold, um, and they'll be tagged in your system as a callback. Um, I would ensure your end of call actions. So if an agent selects uh, not interested, um, was that really a DNC? What did the consumer say? Yeah, right? Does it not interested disposition on your system? Um, actually DNC them, does it allow them to be redialed? And then you know, some of the obvious, are you QCing these dispositions randomly to ensure uh, your agents are adhering to these protocols? Um, for inbound threats, um, I would not look at, look at it as though you're immune to issues, um, especially if you're running something like SMS to inbound. Uh, that'll represent the same exposure, if not worse, than outbound dialing. Um, companies like Ringba provide TCPA Shield technology for inbound call scrubbing. We use it. We have been since they uh, since they implemented it. Um, and then just lastly, you know, if you're if you're operating a lead generation operation. Um, I would be very cognizant of um, having some sort of distributed validation. So if you're using both SaaS and as we do some proprietary integrations, you end up with a lot of decentralization. So ensuring that any TCPA or CCPA or DNC requests are honored across all systems is really important. 
we do see a lot of people who've been tagged as litigators repeatedly um, complete our forms over and over. Um, these leads are tagged accordingly and they're stored uh, to a completely separate leads table um, to prevent engaging the data in any way. Uh, we also see people who filed for CCPA requests return um, and people who've DNC'd call back in. And so we have measures for all of those things in place. Cool. Thank you for providing that information, uh, Manny. Um, Chris, I want to kind of like pivot to you now. What has been your experience um, being in the Legion space? Um, have you had any exposure to any sort of like TCPA actions? And could you speak to that? And then also, what are some of the um, best practices that you would recommend uh, for anyone that's in a similar situation as yourself? Yeah, I'm kind of in this weird middle market where we generate our own leads for ourselves and our clients, but we also uh, purchase leads from other individuals uh, mm -hmm. to help amplify volume and stuff like that. Um, however, we have a pretty stringent process in regards to like what quality is and what we allow to go to our end buyers uh, for what we do. But in my experience, like the hardest thing of being in the middle of the market or an aggregator is making sure that the people that you're receiving leads from or the things you're doing internally are actually compliant with what the laws say, right? You don't want to get on the wrong side of the fence on this one and end up getting, you know, uh, a fine or something like that. You just don't want to be in that situation. So, our best practices for us and what what we found is using a tool like Active Prospect, the lead conduit uh, prospect uh, tool, because, you know, you get to make sure that the leads that are coming in, in addition to leads you're already generating, are compliant and people have, you know given consent to contact them and so on and so forth. So um, making sure your upstream individuals, either publishers or whoever you're getting those leads from uh, before you actually pass into your end buyer um, is compliant and make sure that you're protecting yourself all the way around, right? And also you gotta be able to store them as well. So the best practices is just making sure if you're generating leads yourself, you're always getting you know, your protection, the consent in. And then if you're getting the leads from somewhere else to uh, pass your buyer or to enhance before you actually send them off to your buyer, that is another thing is, is using a tool and making sure like they have a trusted form search so that way you're complying all the way down perfect um, thank you for that, chris i appreciate that uh you providing us that that information and last but not least we'll definitely have to pass it on to the czar himself all things tcpa compliance eric anything any other insights that you would like to add or tidbits to our listeners well, out I here just, i just struggle because the title on the page is TCPA risks. And all we've done is talk about solutions. So my little brain, my little linear brain is about to explode because we haven't covered any of the risks. Um, but first of all, let me just say, Manny and Chris, fantastic stuff, guys. Honestly, I mean, like this is, uh, this is not TCPA 101. This is like one, you know, 210 or something. Like that was, Manny, your, your breakdown was advanced. Uh, I agree with all of those tips. And Chris, you too, man. Like, um, but for those of you that are watching this that are like, well, what are the risks though? Like, why, why do I care? What do I, what, what matters? Uh, understand that of course, if you're making outbound calls, right, especially marketing calls, then you are going to be subject to the TCPA, which is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, the federal response to the robocall epidemic in this country. Uh, and that requires you of course, to have express written consent of the consumer that you are reaching out to. The risks that are attended the TCPA is that if you don't have the correct level of consent, and you are using regulated technology or making marketing calls to individuals on the DMC, it is $500 per call. If you are a buyer of leads, right? I'm gonna go through the list here in order. Lead buyers, right? Your primary risk is that your lead seller is not tell, giving you the real deal, right? They're giving you a phony lead, which happens all the time, or uh, that you're not gonna be able to demonstrate the proof of what was on that screen at the time that the consumer visited the website. You heard Chris tell you that Active Prospect can assist you with that very profound risk and, and provide you with a really good um, protection. Uh, and of course, individuals that are litigators, as Manny told you, will come onto these websites and they'll fill these forms out and they'll try to get you to bite and sue them, but you can get them out of the ecosystem by using, like he said, dmc.com. I think it's a great solution, but the risk, of course, is that these people get into your funnel and that you make outbound calls to them and they turn around and sue you for it, even though they filled out the form. It's flipping garbage. 
Um, if you're a lead seller, your primary risks, uh, again, if you're making outbound calls to do a warm transfer or otherwise to get people into the ecosystem, then you have the TCPA risk resting on your shoulders. It doesn't matter that you're selling somebody else's product. The fact that you're making the call, you can be directly sued by the plaintiff. Again, $500 per call if the lead is not valid. Uh, and your secondary risk is if you are not making the outbound call, you're merely passing on the data, of course, is that you could be sued for indemnity by the lead buyer who's going to be looking to you and say, hey, why'd you give me a, a lead with that the plaintiff is claiming is not valid? Understand, that risk exists even if it is a good lead and you've got some litigator troll that is suing, you still might be on the hook because the mere allegation that the lead is insufficient would be sufficient in most instances to trigger that indemnity. Um, so keep that in mind. And then um, this lead generator is generally talking about a publisher. You know, the risk goes all the way downstream. So as a pub, right, or an affiliate, generally you're not making the outbound call. You're merely selling data. You might think, hey, you know, maybe I'll get my numbers up this month and pepper the steak and put some fake leads in there. Don't you dare do it because, of course, you're going to owe indemnity to the aggregator. Aggregator is going to owe that indemnity to the buyer, and it's going to go all the way back down to you. And believe me, if I'm representing the buyer, I'm going to come all the way after you and make sure that you do not get away with it. So no fraud, but if you're a good player as a, as a publisher, uh, your primary risks are not actually TCPA risks, right? If you've got that, that website, um, owned, and those of you that are generating owned and operated, keep in mind things like the California Invasion of Privacy Act, which Manny was talking to me about before we jumped on, uh, that has a $5,000 per violation penalty if you are using, for instance, Active Prospect or, or other um, companies' products to, to do web session recording and you're not getting the correct disclosure up front. That's a significant risk and something that you really need to keep in mind. Although you have to be using something like Active Prospect in order for your lead to be valuable in the marketplace, because I tell all of my clients, don't you dare buy a third-party lead unless it has a third-party verification like an Active Prospect. So those are the risks. They've already given you the solutions, and that was a pretty valuable 10 minutes, I would say. Thank you for providing that, that information, Eric. Super helpful on this call. So we'll just slide, move right along into our second topic. Why everyone needs litigation protection. So I'm just gonna open this up uh, for Eric and Chris to touch on. I'll let you run with it, Eric. You're the, you're the, you're the man in this space. <laughs> I just like to hold on. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, it's pretty obvious why you need litigation protection, right? I mean, if you if you get sued, you've got, there's there's two components to it. I was just talking to somebody today. They've got a great case. I feel so bad for them because even though the case is garbage, they're going to have to pay us, you know, X tens of thousands of dollars to defend the case. And that's just that's just the way it goes, right? It's a, it's a very unfortunate thing. Uh, and I actually do feel bad. Like, I feel bad in cases like this. It's like, man, I wish I wasn't running a business. I could just do it for free, you know, but unfortunately... I've got, to, I've got to pay people salaries and keep the lights on, so I've got to charge for the service. Um, but look, you, you get sued in a TCPA case or a California Invasion of Privacy Act case, uh, you're facing, depending on the volume of calls that you're making, it's $500 per call, right? Um, if you buy, and generally speaking, you've got a class action, right? And so you're looking back at four years worth of potential outbound calls that are at issue. At the highest level, you could imagine, you know, 500 times the number of calls you've made over the last four years, that's your potential exposure. Of course, you know, we're experts at carving this stuff down and making sure that you don't face exposure that's high, that, that is that high. But even if that, you know, you narrow the case to just, you know, that the leads that you bought from the one source that ended up being a problem, right? Typically, you're still gonna be talking about thousands or hundreds of thousands or sometimes even millions of calls from that source. Uh, and you multiply that times 500, right? And that's your exposure. So very, very rarely do you see one of these cases that's worth less than a million bucks. Usually you're talking 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars or more. Uh, and with the TCPA, of course, there's, there's not just liability to the company, there's personal liability to you as well, right? So, you, you know, whoever is making the phone call, whoever is running the, camp, the, the dialer, whoever is the CEO that came up with the business plan for a small company, all of you can be personally sued for your personal car, house, bank account. It's, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible statute. Um, and so you have to take this stuff incredibly seriously. And, and secondarily, you have to keep in mind that the TCPA is a hotly, hotly litigated statute. In fact, I say it's the biggest golden goose in the history of the plaintiff's bar. 
more plaintiffs, millionaires have been made under the TCPA than under any other federal statute. They just love to sue. And as you folks know, there's litigator trolls out there who make a living suing on the statute. Uh, so the stakes couldn't be higher. The litigation environment could not be more um, just vicious. Uh, and the guys that are bringing these cases are very smart, right? So, you know, you just have to be incredibly cautious on the front end. We talk about compliance here at Troutman Amin, compliance, 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 compliance. And as you heard Manny and Chris tell you earlier, compliance starts with intelligent decision-making uh, and leveraging great vendors like Active Prospect. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. I just Perfect. want to add one thing. I mean, when we were talking about protection, you know, Eric hit about all the risks and everything associated with this. Is like when you're talking about compliance, like make sure your your instrument you're using with your vendor, which is your agreements, is you're setting the expectations. If you're the buyer of the lead or you're generating leads or whatever it is, make sure you're setting those expectations in your agreements because you want to make sure that it's clear that if they violate X, Y, and Z, that there's indemnity and that rolls all the way back up to the individual. So just make sure your instruments, which is your agreements, your insertion orders that you put out there in the world, uh, help you in that realm as well to prevent you even having to walk into Eric's office. Right. Thank you, guys. And I just want to just pivot real quickly. We had two questions in the chat, and the first question was actually for Chris. Chris, what tool did you say you use to help with uh, lead validation and um, TCPA compliance? Active Prospect. We use Lead Conduit specifically for that that instance. We run all of our leads, whether we're generating them ourselves on our on our landing pages or buying them from third parties. We run everything through. Uh, uh, the lead conduit to not only validate the information, run it through litigation, if, make sure they're not no litigators, enhance the data, make sure their emails are valid, make sure their phone numbers valid, all these things that we expect from a lead before we ever accept the lead as like an yeah, acceptable post, if that makes any sense. We reject everything that doesn't meet our standards. And as a buyer, I set the standards. So I make sure that we're compliant. Perfect. Thank you That's for that. So yeah, and let me just let me just re-emphasize that, Chris. I mean, I think that's so important. And a lot of my clients, even very sophisticated major buyers, don't understand the importance of gating, right? Don't accept that lead unless it meets all of your standards and use a technology platform like Lead Conduit to make sure that all of your requirements are met before you ever pay for the deck thing. Uh, it's it's remarkable that a lot of folks don't do that. So good on you, Chris. Yeah. And the second question um, in the chat, they said, I believe there was some recent case where Janaya and Active Prospect was used as the plaintiff. One, because the permission to use those were not given. Is that correct? And how can we mitigate this risk? Yeah. So that's the California Invasion of Privacy Act that I mentioned a couple of times. That's SIPA. So that risk is going to sit on the owner of the website. So if you're downstream and you're buying a lead, that has active prospect, that is not your risk. Okay, that risk is only for the person that has the website. So if you're owned and operated, right, uh, that is gonna be potentially your risk and it applies to anyone that has a, uh, a website that's available to California consumers. Um, and so, you know, just breaking it down at the highest level, essentially the use of active prospect or, or similar products, right, anything that is going to be tracking the occurrence on a website, um, by a third party might, and I emphasize might, because the case law is still developing here, and, and I'm going to kill it, so don't worry, I'm going to kill it. But for right now, uh, there is case law that suggests that the use of this technology constitutes eavesdropping in California, the concept being that I go to, you know, bobshammockshop.com, I'm communicating with Bob's Hammock Shop. If somebody else is listening in, that's an eavesdropper, right? Um, so that's it's fine though so long as you have the consumer's consent uh, and the consent can be obtained through to, through typical terms and conditions uh, there's kind of a split of authority right now whether or not there has to be a click through there's a lot of kind of little permutations to this we're happy to help you i'll give you like a free consultation we can talk it through but the bottom line is you have to get the consumer's consent before you start recording and that's the trick right that's the trick you can't get the consent and have it be recorded that you got the consent. So there's generally two layers of consent now that's required. The first layer is to get the consent to record. And then the second layer, usually on a different page, is gonna be the actual TCPA consent, of course, that you're using Active Prospect to capture in the first place, right? So first you get the consent to record it, then you get the consent being recorded to provide that TCPA consent. 
I know it's kind of a pain, but it's a two-step dance now in California, at least until the case law settles down, which will hopefully be here in the next six months or so. Perfect. Thank you for that, Eric. And as we move right along into our third topic, how can increased protection boost your ROI? And this is a question for Chris. And then Eric, feel free to jump in. Oh, Manny. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a a clear cut decision to be compliant to boost your ROI. Um, obviously, we all know the risks associated with not being compliant, but as it relates to ROI, there's essentially two things that could happen, right? Your by running your leads or your third party leads or your leads are generating through a system like, for example, Lead Conduit to enhance the data. Think about the value. Now you're not just generating, you know, leads and passing it off to your buyers. You're generating leads, validating the data, making sure they're not, you know, a known litigator, running through the DNC, making sure their email's correct, make sure their phone number's valid. It's like you're doing all these extra things to enhance the data to make it more valid. That increases your end selling price for that lead to your end buyer. That's one way to increase your ROI. Two is if you happen to be an agency or an aggregator, somebody who accepts returns for bad leads because somebody lied on the form, I do all the time with our stuff. Now, if you're not compliant and you're passing these leads without doing this validation check, now you're, uh, when there's lead return requests coming in, now you have your operations of your of your own agency running through these things and validating the returns, make sure they're good or not, right? Think about the operational drain cost on that. So if I can just tell you from experience, implementing what we've done here with Active Prospect has dramatically reduced that because now I have a screen share to go to to validate the information. I have all these things that go off of to lessen the number of lead credits. So it's not only like, reducing your risk of litigation, it's increasing the value of your lead because you have these extra enhancements, but also reducing your operational cost, which obviously increases your bottom line altogether. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And actually this slide here is, this slide here is powerful because um, just look at the, the dollar amounts that is indicated here on this slide. And Eric, this question is for you, for the people that's on this webinar, who's gonna be viewing this webinar and are not taking TCPA, uh, you know, risk seriously. Could you speak to some of these cases or with these numbers here on this slide and just emphasize yeah, well, the, I mean, of the risk? Everybody has to take the risk seriously. Uh, I, I, I doubt there's even a single human being alive that understands the TCPA world that doesn't take it seriously. Like you have to take it seriously and you have to take it seriously for two reasons. One, of course, because the volume of litigation is so high. Right. This is not like a lightning bolt in the dark. This is given enough time. So I'd say, right, you know, it's that old that old uh, line from Fight Club, right? On a long enough timeline, the survivability of everybody drops to zero. And it's the same thing in TCPA world, right? On a long enough timeline, everybody is going to get sued if you're making outbound calls under the TCPA. It's just a matter of time, right? And so you have to protect yourself, put yourself in the best possible position to defend these suits when they arise uh, because of the huge number of litigators that are out there. Um, but then the secondary piece, of course, of the risk is just the massive, massive exposure that these cases create. Uh, and this slide gives you, you know, a nice little peek at a couple of things. Um, you know, everyone knows about this $900 million verdict against Vaisalis, uh, which the, the Supreme Court uh, refused to reduce, the Ninth Circuit refused to reduce. Right, this company is living with a billion dollar judgment. There's nothing they can do about it. Uh, and you see these settlements, right? Uh, for 2019, 2021, but the one that to me stands out the most is Keller Williams, $40 million, guys. And that was just this year, right? It's not like it was, you know, six years ago or something. The TCPA remains a clear and present threat to everybody. Um, and, you know, Keller Williams, I think it's just a great example to show, you know, that all of the assumptions that people have, they really, they really don't hold up in TCPA world. You know, Keller Williams, the calls at issue were not made by the parent company. These calls were made by, by franchisees, by, by agents of franchisees, like downstream, you know, people that are independents, people that are your local realtor, right? That we all know they're, they're their own little independent contractor, right? They're their own little shop. And yet the parent company can be sued because in TCPA world, just like you're personally liable, that liability flows straight up to anybody that's using that brand name. And we saw the same thing with, uh, with Allstate recently. Um, so whoever you are, right, whatever your role in the ecosystem, even if you think you're independent, in the TCPA world, man, you, you are going to just be a conduit that they're going to use to get to the big brand, the big deep pockets above you. Um, so everyone, 
everybody needs to be taking this risk extremely, extremely seriously. Sure. And if Thank anybody you. missed Derek's part on them being able to go after you personally, like if that isn't motivating enough, like this isn't like you're just going to wrap up your business. Like it, they're, they're going to go Oh away. my God. I, yeah, I hear like, that all the time, right? As you can imagine, Manny, you know, somebody's like, well, Eric, you know, I'll just, I'll just close my shop and start a new one. I'm like, okay, well, you can do that. Make sure you're planning to file a personal bankruptcy while you're at it because they're just going to name you to the complaint, right? <laughs> so if, you're, if your strategy is I'm going to violate the law and then just create a new LLC, that is a bad strategy. That is a bad strategy. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some people that just don't care, right? And, uh, you know, if you're a bad actor that just doesn't care, like, you know, there's a couple of people I can think of that have million, multi-million dollar judgments against them and, you know, they're like, whatever, I'll, I'll move to Guam. Okay, you know, you can live your life how you see fit. But for most normal people that want to be part of polite society, you, you got to take TCPA very seriously. Perfect. Thank you for that, Eric. And we do have another question in the chat. And it says, as an affiliate, if I'm using some sort of a robot to make outbound calls, would TCPA still be a risk of mine or theirs for vendors if you're calling on behalf of vendors? I'm not sure I totally track that question, but if you are using a robot to make calls, then you are at risk, no question. Uh, it can be a fuzzier question if you are the brand and you are using a downstream partner who is using their own data, making robocalls, and then you as the brand are buying some segment of those leads, um, you know, there might be sufficient a distance there to say you know that, that the brand's not vicariously liable liable so i didn't 100 percent grasp the question the factual scenario but yeah if, if you're the one making the calls then yeah you're you're definitely at risk yeah. no question i think i think you just left out one part of the of the of the sentence earlier but it says uh, if they're using it says they're using some robot call vendor meaning they're contracting the vendor to do the calls on their behalf yeah. so it is there it's, it is them yeah so you're definitely you're definitely going to be potentially liable there um and, and understand and this is one thing that confuses people, Chris, I, I know you could break this down Paul, from your vantage point better than me, uh, but indemnity and the kind of the way it works, right? People think, well, hey, I've got an indemnity agreement with the robot vendor, right? So if I ever get sued, it's, you know, it's their risks, not mine, but that's not the way indemnity works. You still get sued, right? You might be able to say to the robot vendor, hey, you have to pay for this, you know, because I'm getting sued. You have to defend me. And if I get hit for $10 million, you have to pay it but you are still in the lawsuit. You're still stuck in the lawsuit and you are still gonna have potentially a judgment that says you owe $10 million. The fact that you might be able to get somebody else to pay it on an indemnity claim, cool, right? But you know, you gotta keep in mind, it's your risk still, it's your name and the judgment's gonna be in your name. And maybe that paper with the robot vendor isn't really worth the, the you know, money it's printed or the paper it's printed on. <laughs> Perfect. So as we move along, we're moving on to topic number four, how to leverage Facebook lead ads. And this is a question for Chris and Justin. Uh, I know Chris, you have experience running uh, campaigns on Facebook. And could you talk a little bit about the risk associated with that? Yeah, actually, this is actually a very good topic because uh, Facebook is such a closed environment. So if you do anything on their platform, they don't allow you to run a script to grab a trusted form URL. So like if you run ads on Facebook and use Facebook lead forms, you have the inability to make sure that you are compliant and compliant with the laws. You may try with like some disclosure on the forms or whatever it is, but it's not necessarily that extra added layer that you would get with a trusted form cert uh, on a landing page, for example. Um, so. With that being said, actually, this this specific topic is the main reason I engaged with Active Prospect in the first place is because we got a much better ROI on our Facebook lead form ads than we did our landing page, and I wanted to make sure that we were compliant. So that's kind of how this relationship started. Is now we're running, you know, a combination of a lot of different strategies, but one of them is Facebook lead forms, and every along the line, we're getting a trusted form cert because you guys have an active integration with them to allow. Uh, for us to get that to make sure we're compliant. So, perfect. Just to uh, add on to that a little bit, since some aren't familiar, I think, with the connection that we have with them, I think, to my knowledge, we're the only solution in the marketplace that has a relationship with Meta um, in terms of collecting consent within the Facebook platform 
and this is done via lead conduit, which Chris was mentioning earlier, which is a part of kind of our suite, uh, which actually makes the integration or connection between Facebook lead ads and trusted form itself, which helps to associate and then claim, which claiming is just signaling to us that we want to store that so you can access for the next five years for um, uh, TCP purposes. And I just wanted to just get Eric's opinion on this. Uh, for the detractors that says, ah, we're running Facebook lead ads, we don't need protection. Do you want to add? Well, I mean, look, you always need protection, right? I mean, I don't care if you're a closed environment, I don't care kind of where you're at. Remember that as a caller, you have the burden of proof, right? You have to prove what took place in that Facebook environment on that day. And how are you going to do that? Like, you have a plan for that, right? I mean, if you have your own website, I'm sure you might have your web engineer talk about the web session data that you capture, the IP addresses, et cetera. But unless your name is Meta, you're not going to have that ability in the Facebook environment. So as far as I'm concerned, you've got one way and only one way to meet your burden, and that's to use some sort of technology like an active prospect to make sure that you're capturing what took place on the screen that day. Or, I mean, I guess you could just hope that the consumer says, yeah, you're right. I I clicked the button, I, I signed it, but I'm pretty sure that's not how these cases go. Let me ask a guy who's handled 500 of them. Hey, Eric, yes? Is that how these cases go? No, it's not. Oh, okay, so we're good. <laughs> Thank you for that, Eric. And as we move right along to topic number five, um, and this is actually directed to Eric and Justin, uh, NPRM Ooh. trends and FCC updates. Do you have any updates to share with us? and our attendees here on this uh, webinar? Yeah, so this thing is called The Last of Us, right? Which is very like apocalyptic. It's like, it's just like it's us left in the world. And, and it's dark, but you know, truthfully, here coming with the NPRM that the FCC is considering, it may really start to look like there's only a few players out there. And so let me kind of break this down, right? I don't want anyone to freak out too much, but maybe a little. Um, so the FCC, hopefully you all know, that's the primary federal regulator of TCPA. Uh, they're charged with basically making sure that our phones stop ringing with a bunch of unwanted robocalls. Uh, they've commenced a, a proceeding, which is called a, a notice of a proposed rulemaking, uh, where they're going to come out and, and make a new, a new rule that everybody has to follow regarding express consent for the TCPA. Uh, and specifically as to lead generators, they are considering a few different options. It's a bit of a waterfall, right, in terms of where they're going to land. At the very top, right, the, the, the threshold, riskiest, worst possibility, against possibility, this has not yet been determined, it's possibility, is that they're going to say that all leads have to be, uh, basically, well, that there are no leads, that any consent has to be directly between a consumer and a brand. So I'll pick on my good client, Lone Depot, who I love so much. Uh, in this environment, Lone Depot could never buy a lead, not even from Lending Tree, from no one, from nowhere. The only leads that Lone Depot could have would be people that went onto the LoneDepot.com website and filled out a form and gave Lone Depot, and only Lone Depot, the consent, and then Lone Depot could call. So that's what's being called the Public Knowledge Proposal, the PK Proposal, which is currently part of the NPRM the FCC is considering. That's the highest level of the waterfall. Uh, my organization, REACH, which hopefully you guys know about, is laser focused on destroying that, right? Because of course, that's gonna put so many people out of business if the FCC does that. It's really dumb and it's really unnecessary. But that's one possibility. The second possibility right below that, uh, so, and let me just say, I don't think this is gonna happen because I think we're gonna kill it. We're working on killing it, we'll see. The second one, which is right below that, is a little bit different. It allows intermediaries, but it requires one-to-one -one consent. So for instance, you could operate a website, you could have a comparison shopping page, but at the end of the flow, the consumer would only be agreeing to receive consent from one lender. Currently, right, as you know, you go to Lending Tree, there's a list of 800, and you get connected with five, right? That's, that's the way we live today. Under this proposal, there might be 800 at the beginning of the flow, but by the end, the consumer is going to be matched with one. It's like Hotwire, right? You get one, right? You know, hotel or whatever it is you're buying. Uh, and that's the concept with, with this is that it would ultimately be if it's Lone Depot, Lone Depot could buy a lead from, we'll just pick on Lending Tree, but at the end of the flow, Lending Tree would have to show the consumer, congratulations, you're connected with, Lend with Lone Depot, and then only Lone Depot would get that lead. Okay, that's it. That'd be the end of, of you know, 
multiple lead sales, the end of aggregators, because it has to go just through one, one person. That's the second flow uh, or second possibility. Again, trying to kill that, pretty extreme. The third possibility, which is I think pretty likely, and everybody just needs to get ready for it, uh, is something called uh, the topically and logically related test. And essentially what that's gonna require is that if you go onto a website um, that is about lending products, right? The um, website operator can sell, you know, can have 100 partners, uh, they can sell your, your lead up to five times, just like in the current environment. But what they can't do is sell you something that is not logically and topically related to lending. So in the current environment, as you folks know, there's lots of multi-vertical pages where you go on and you're interested in lending or you know, you're interested in a real estate agent and they'll sell you lending. You're interested in lending and they'll sell you solar, right? And then you'll, you'll accept the, the disclosure and on the bottom, right, those, that little fine print will say, you're agreeing to hear from all of our marketing partners about anything having to do with the home services. And now you're, you know, people that, that do lawn mowing services can call you. That is probably coming to an end, okay? The, the FCC has signaled pretty strongly that the idea of multi-vertical pages is done. Uh, the idea of sweepstakes pages, largely they're done. Uh, and so the post NPRM environment, the last of us uh, are going to be companies that maybe, you know, you get away with comparison shopping still, maybe you can get away with selling a lead multiple times, but that lead is going to have to be focused on a specific product or a specific suite of products within, right, the general framework of the website that you're looking at. I'll just throw one more note out there, which is the FCC is also considering uh, destroying hyperlinks for marketing partner pages meaning that you can no longer use a hyperlink to show the consumer who it is that you're giving consent for. Everybody that you're consenting to receive calls from would have to be in the disclosure itself, facing the consumer, which of course could make for a very long disclosure. Um, or of course, we'd have to have dynamic disclosures in, most, you know, in all likelihood if that happens, where only the people they might be matched with would ultimately show up on that last page. We're trying to get, again, REACH is trying to get the FCC to reconsider that. I think that's just frankly dumb because hyperlinks are not the problem. The problem, of course, is excessive matching and age leads. Um, but so that's what the, the uh, FCC is considering right now. That is hot and heavy. That is what we are all over here at Troutman Amin LLP trying to keep the, the lights on for the lead generation industry. I think we're going to be able to do it, but I just, you know, public service announcement. When this NPRM comes out, I do think the, the days of multi-vertical disclosures and multi-vertical websites, I think they're gone, guys. So be ready. Wow. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Earl, did you tell all the attendees he's going to send them a bill? Do they all know? <laughs> we need to, right? We need to. So one, we have a question thing, in the chat. Earl, specific. Quick. One thing I want to add, just to kind of to that, to what Eric was going over and how that kind of relates to trusted form, we're, we're already kind of set up that way. So we're talking about what trusted form does in terms of collecting consent. What we're doing is recording what's happening on a page, and that's also looking at what's written on the page. So one thing that we can help with is ensuring that if you have specific consent language that you need present on third-party forms, we can ensure that those are that's actually present on the, on the leads that you're getting. And that, that kind of works for both multi-vertical sweepstakes or incentivized traffic that we can help to detect if something is or isn't on a form. So just wanted to add that we're kind of already set up to do some of these things with trusted form. I think it's great. I mean, that visual rendering that you guys have is a great enhancement that ensures that, for instance, if, it, if the logical and topical relationship test is applied, you're going to be able to use trusted form in its current state without any modification to show that, in fact, that test is being met based upon the format of the website that the consumer is on at the time they accept the disclosure. I think that's incredibly powerful. And it's nice to know that the solution is already set up for the post NPRM environment, you know, however this thing lands. So I think that's great. Yeah, awesome. So we have a question here in the chat, and this question is specifically for Chris. As an aggregator who is just starting out with active prospect and trusted form, what is the best approach that you can get your lead sources on board with adding trusted form? A lot of the prefer a lot of them prefer to sell to other buyers other than implementing it on their forms. <laughs> this is kind of like a topic of like when you're going to war and you want to have a strategy of like how you're going to beat the opponent in the situation, you lie in wait and wait for them to come to you because at the end of the day, they're going to have to have this. Like they can't just continually sell leads to other individuals or other buyers without a trusted form of some sort of TCPA, TCPA client. So if the 
buyer or the supplier doesn't want to give you that consent, you don't need to work with them because honestly, it's not worth the risk. If you saw those numbers on the litigation on the, the, the litigation slide, the numbers are not worth it. Like just go on to the next, find another supplier that'll actually provide you what you want. I strictly, in all my agreements with every supplier that I do business with, and I weed them out all the time, they have to pass a valid trusted form of cert period, like in, an, in a story, like that's my first line of discussion with them. Like, do you have trusted form of certs and can you provide them to me on, on post? If they say no, all right, thanks. This is not going to work out. Next, next one, moving on to the next one. It's just the way I do business. Perfect. Like, Thank you. Yeah. That, uh, to the, you know, how it boosts your ROI, right? Like it's, I look at that as being very similar. I mean, we, we receive dozens of audits every week from carriers. The fact that we could provide uh, chain of custody and proof of consent shows that we're a partner that could be trusted that has things you know we do things correctly um indirectly that translates to confidence in our partners and when combined with strong performance um you're assigned larger caps more volume allocation to you yeah thank you we have another question in the chat and i advise everyone to keep the questions coming because we have time um the question is i'm going to just throw this out for everyone what and how is the best way to deal with professional screamers screamers that try to uh bring complaints and lawsuits for a living well i've got thoughts from an outside perspective um but i mean manny and chris i don't know if you guys have a, a, a if you want to respond to that if not i'll just I can, I can do it, but you guys you can you gotta run them. You got to run them through some sort of database to screen them for known litigators. And there's, I'm not saying you specifically have to use the conduit, but there's other, there's, there's databases other, like even DNC, like you can tap into that one automatically yourself. But I mean, obviously, preferably you would use lead conduit because now you get all these other things associated with it, like blacklist alliance, the DNC list, like all these things you can screen for just to be like double check double check and triple check before a lead ever goes your buyer that they're not on that list right the last thing you want to do is be on that somebody's radar yeah so you definitely want to be using a litigator scrum but but what i would say about these guys is, is there's there's really there's there's two kinds of cases that these professionals bring there's the kind of case where you should actually be grateful for it and then there's the kind of case where you should you know go to battle with the tomahawk and take their scalp Right. So where, you know, this guy comes in and he's actually got a valid claim, right? Like you actually did call the guy and you shouldn't have because it turns out that your partner screwed up or, or you, your process wasn't right. Right. And we see this from time to time. Oh my God, there was a gap. It was supposed to work this way. It didn't work that way. And as a result, uh, an illegal call got made, right? The active prospect wasn't set up properly. Like some, something went wrong in your process. You know, believe it or not, in those cases, even though the guy's a scumbag, you should be thinking, I'm glad. I'm glad this guy came along because now you can fix your process. You can avoid a big class action, right? And you, these guys can buy them off generally for, you know, a couple of pennies. Um, now, they get incentivized. They want to come back because they think they, they've got you, right? And that is a problem. But by the same token, the bigger problem is that you had a gap in your process that you have now fixed, right? So you have to look at that as, as a positive thing. Now, of course, if you've got good compliance counsel, hopefully you wouldn't have had that gap to begin with. So if you really don't want to be paying these guys, you start with compliance. Now, the time when you go to battle with the Tomahawk is where everything's squeaky clean, everything looks right, the process is good, you didn't do anything wrong, and he's just like, yeah, well, you called me, so I want you to pay me, right? And I can name you a couple of people, I'm not going to, because that's just not very nice, <laughs> but that is literally their MO, like that's what they do for a living, they put their, their, you know, their phone numbers on these websites, or they let their buddies do it, and you know you didn't do anything wrong your process is clean you know you've got a good active prospect the the ip addresses match right there's no there's no lead fraud no bot detect it's just clean i mean you can't pay those guys right you you owe in my opinion you know and maybe look maybe i'm self-interested here because i'm a lawyer and i want to bring and i want to defend you and i want to go after these guys but from my perspective like you owe all of industry you know a duty to to not enable these guys and feed that and feed them cookies right to these little mice uh, you got to go after these rodents with a flamethrower, uh, and I dare say I think I'm a flamethrower. Uh, so you can always reach out to us. There's other lawyers, of course, but if you find yourself in that situation, first you need to assess, right? Again, what kind of situation is this? Is this one where I should be reluctantly grateful, or is this one where I should go out there and take someone's head off? Um, and you know, if it's the latter, give me a call. If it's the former, you know, be smart, clean up, write a check, and move on with your life and be grateful. That's that's the way I look at it. 
Love it. Thank you. We have another question that came in. If a business add their number to the DNC list, is it valid and can we still call them? Sorry, I'm not sure I tracked that question. If they add it, if they add it to the national DNC list? Yes, that's what they're saying. If they add add the number to the uh, DNC list, is it valid and can we still call them? So if you had the expressed written consent that you need before they added the number to the DNC list and you weren't told not to call, the fact that the consumer added the number to the DNC list after the fact does not trump your express written consent that came previously in time. Now, if your express written consent wasn't valid to begin with, well then, you know, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, but the mere fact that the consumer added themselves to the list after the fact doesn't matter. Your express written consent is still is still going to be binding. Uh, now, of course, if the consumer tells you, don't call me, right, that's, that's different. You no longer have that consent. It is gone. Um, and if you don't have express written consent to begin with, then, yeah, you can't call them. For one, you shouldn't have been doing it to begin with. And the fact that they put themselves in the DMC would now give you a further indication that you shouldn't be calling them. And just to add to that question, and you may have answered this, Eric, in your response, if they already have a number that is logged in on the DNC and then they fill out a form, can they still be contacted technically? Because I think there's over 200 million phone numbers that are on the DNC yeah. list. Yeah, I mean, as long so, so here's the rule, right? If a phone number is on the DNC list, you cannot call it cold call, okay? You can still call it if you have express written consent, one, an inquiry for 90 days, or an established business relationship. So even if that phone number is on the DNC, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm interested in your product, hey, but I, I gotta run, call me back, click, you can still call them back, right? Manually, right? You have to understand there's two different sections of the TCPA. There's the regulated technology uh, provisions that look at the use of an auto dialer or pre-recorded call to call a cell phone. If you're using that technology for marketing purposes, it doesn't matter if the number's on the DMC or not. It doesn't matter. You have to have express written consent. But assuming for a second you're calling manually, then you're only looking at DNC issues, right? If we're only looking at DNC issues, then you can call a number on the DNC with either express written consent, inquiry, or an EBR. So if the number is already on the DNC and they fill out a form, now you have express written consent. Now you can make that out and call even though they're on the list. Perfect. As we close out, any final thoughts? I'll start with Manny first. No, I think, you know, obviously, I think we've all spoken from our experience and our position. Um, I think everybody shared a lot of valuable information. Um, if, you know, if you're, if you're running a contact center operation and you're doing outreach and you're generating leads, um, it, a lot of what we've covered here is sort of like surface level best practices, um, SOPs, if you will, to some extent, right? Like you, you need to be keenly aware of where those leaks are um, because these guys are relentless. Like they come at you hard and it's very expensive. And I think when companies are smaller, they take risks that they don't take as the business matures. And what you don't want is you don't want to make mistakes early on in your, in your business or you know, in your journey that cost you hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, or now you're involved in some litigation and it comes up years later, why did this happen? Or like, just get off on the right foot. And I, I mainly mentioned this because one of the people said, you know, well, can we ask our buyers to, to pay for the, because it's not just, you know, you have to, you're claiming the certs, right? So you're paying to claim the certs. Um, relative to the cost, versus what it'll cost you legally, like just do it correctly. I feel like a lot of questions are based around how can I kind of get around this or get around that? And that, that's not what this is about. Um, just do it correctly. You're the, you know, the, the, the space will recognize you for doing it correctly. You'll be rewarded many times over and you probably won't deal with the same type of issues that um, others in this space that are trying to cut corners are gonna deal with. I mean, it's just really straightforward. Thank you for that, Manny. Chris? I mean, Manny hit the nail on the head, man. I mean, as long as you, whether you're a solo shop or you're, you know, a huge enterprise, 
this is something that just has to be done and you have to make sure that you're compliant with it. The last thing you want to do is start a business and go out your own and hang up your own shingle and get, you know, two, three years down the road. And all of a sudden you have this huge hole that causes you a big problem. And then you never get to be the enterprise like that. You don't want to be that person. So just get off on the right foot. I mean, the, the cost associated with may, maybe let's say high, but it's nominal compared to the, like the amount of legality that may be associated with it if you do something uh, heavily wrong. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Justin, any final thoughts? No, just really a thank you to the fellow panelists. Honestly, it's great to hear from, you know, customers of ours, clients of ours that are that are using this and then in the same kind of breath hearing, you know, Eric speak to, you know, how we fit into this puzzle and kind of the importance of having um, trusted form as part of the stack of being compliant and being, you know, uh, buttoned up when it comes to GCPA. Perfect. Thank you. And Eric, any final thoughts from you before we close out? Well, I, just, I just thought Manny and Chris's um, thoughts today were remarkable. I'm on a lot of panels and I, I very rarely do I see something as valuable as like the first five minutes of this thing. I mean, it was, that was very, very impressive. Um, the way I look at it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Like in, in any business that you're going to have in any industry in America, there's going to be some law that applies to you, right? If you're in lead generation, the law is the TCPA. That's it. That's the one thing. I mean, sure, if you're in certain verticals, you have to worry about CMS, you have to worry about some content rules, FTC, et cetera. But primarily, your primary law is the TCPA. You, you should never even think for a second that you don't have to comply with it. Like, that's the one thing you have to comply with. Everybody has to comply with it. You have to comply with it. As you all know, there's gobs of money to be made in this industry. Just comply with that law and then go off and have a great profitable profitable business that you don't have to worry about, right? And, and don't get mad at the trolls. Like everyone gets so mad at the litigators all the time. It's like this, this, this echo chamber. Oh, the litigators are the problem. Yes, the litigators are also a problem, but at the end of the day, it's your job to comply with the law. So if the litigators get you because you aren't complying with the law, you know, that's not on them, that's on you. So do your job, take it seriously, Go out there and make a bazillion dollars. I want all of you to be tremendously successful. Just do it compliantly, and then you don't have to worry about anything else on the back end. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. Well, on behalf of Active Prospect and our panelists and our attendees at this webinar, we want to sincerely thank each and every one of you for attending. Um, and this recording is going to be emailed out tomorrow. And at the end, you'll have a two minute pop-up survey. We strongly encourage you to fill that out and give us our feedback on what we can do and what, when, what you enjoyed about this particular webinar. And if you wanna see more webinars like that, like this, please feel free to add that also in the survey. Thank you again, everyone, for being a part of this panel. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah,